Not in the booth at all for this one. I was kind of just manning the, the cards and building decks on the fly, uh, making sure we all had pizza. Uh, but this deck, I'm rewatching it right now and I'm catching up on it. And it's really an interesting draft. There's a lot more fighting than we normally see. Yeah, it was very interesting to see sort of the path that uh, that our, our winner, Mason, had to take to victory here. You know, Mason, Mason one of the, the Chicago crew taking things down uh, for, for the second time, I believe, right. tying, tying him for the, the record. For you know, number number of St. Lotus VRD victories. Sadly true, yeah. It's, we have, it's always tough to see someone from out of town be able to take it down. <laughs> but yes. We have how many two time winners now? Is it we have three? Three. John Ryan, we have Elaine, and now Mason has tied up and is already said for next time he's going to be claiming the title of undisputedly most winning player. <laughs> so And then our other two winners, Brandon and uh, Dan, mm-hmm. were both in this draft as well. Correct. Um so that, that it, Mason had to do a lot of work to to win this draft. He had to really fight with a lot of other players True. to to get where he was trying to go. Should we take a look at the deck that he ended up with? Yeah, absolutely. Let's jump over there. It's kind of interesting because he, he both didn't have to fight, but he kind of chose to opt out of fighting, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and he talked about that in his interview as well, about how he, he saw that he was kind of forced into blue because he had Ancestral, but yep. then... Uh, decided that he didn't want to fight over all these other cards, so he just kind of went into a small creature beatdown plan, which is what he wanted to do if he were in a later position anyway, but he was hoping to do it with goblins instead of with ninjas. Is wait now hang on. I see I see the card Riptide in the mana value one slot. Is this real? Uh that is not real. That is a Riptide Laboratory. It's a Riptide Laboratory. Okay, cool. Yes. Very good. I was like, I know that card. I cast that card when I was ten years old or whatever. It was bad then, it's bad now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot of cards in the dark that make play, and this is not one of them. So uh, but no, his deck, his deck. I mean, it's attacking with Snapcaster Mage, Spell Stutter Sprite, and then bouncing it back with Ninja of the Deep Hours. Um, pretty strong Venser, Shaper Savant, has Caracas for the like for the really ridiculous things like bouncing back V Click and Venser, and you just end up in a, in a soft lock. Uh, and as is Mason's tradition, he ended up going with Lutri, the Spell Chaser, and taking it. I still think I. He, he is the first to say that he doesn't love this card, doesn't think it's like the best card in VRD, but it is free and it's uh, it probably gets cast once a, once a tournament maybe. Um, but the threat of it is always there. Yeah, and uh, I know that Dom, Dom Harvey had this in his, as, as the companion of his winning mm-hmm. uh, Discord VRD deck in his, his blue-red spells list, which frankly was where, and I talked about this during the draft, I was expecting Mason to go yeah. with this, mm-hmm. uh, especially because it appeared that a lot of the red cards were just up for grabs by really anyone. True. Uh, but but Mason chose to really stick to almost entirely mono blue, uh, playing that spell queller as well. But I, I I feel like that that did him a lot of favors. He was able to leverage the power of standstill by yes. doing that a lot more. Allowed him to play a lot more of the creature lands, um, and then also you know being able to play Caracas and actually occasionally use it to cast spell queller, but mostly use it to bounce fence or shape or savant and Vendillion click and so on back to his hand. Yeah, I, I watched him lock Cody out of the game for what seemed like about three weeks <laughs> at one point, at least to Co- if you were, I, I watched Cody age about a year during that match. Yeah. Um, even though he was, he was still having fun, it was, it was laborious, but worked out for Mason. When you're on the affinity list, Crypt, uh, Cryptic Command or Venser are both pretty rough spots to feel in. Yeah, it's just it, getting time walked every turn is just not a good feeling. Right, sometimes twice, right? Sometimes uh, the vents are off the time walk and then actually a time walk. Oof, yeah. And that is also where the the, uh, the Riptide Laboratory comes into play with, again, the vents or the, the, uh, the Vendillion click and, and so on and so forth. Right, and Riptide, I, I was actually surprised at how often it's been taken. I think most of the reason for why it has kind of the 11 out of 64 drafts is because very early on, it was a popular card, like back in 2010, 2011, mm. pri- prior to even Shotgun Lotus. But in the old Wizards drafts, there was always somebody who was doing a Riptide shenanigans deck. So when you look back at the history, a lot of them come from that. It's a pretty fun, a pretty fun card. Right, and that's the you know the kind of thing that you'll find on the 80th page of Mason's notebook, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, totally, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but no, uh, I think Disrupting Shoal is another card. Like, we, we've seen basically every one of the free counter spells, uh, mm-hmm. but Disrupting Shoal is one that, uh, that we haven't seen a lot of in VRD. Uh, but Mason, I mean, I don't know how well it worked out for him. I don't know if we saw it on commentary or all. I'm not, I'm not to that point. Um, but it does seem like it's, it's something that fits well in this deck. Yeah, I don't recall seeing him cast it, but the threat of it along with Force and Misdirection is pretty good. Mm-hmm. Obviously... 
just draft wise, you're not going to get force of will and force of negation unless you are wheeling them, right. you know, from from the one spot. Most likely, I think is is the real only way to do that. But Sounds right. but you know, picking up misdirection and disrupting shoal, especially with how late disrupting shoal goes, Mason has enough of a spread of mana values across mm-hmm. his deck. Uh, that he can counter most relevant spells, right? Yeah, you really only need one through four. Yeah. Um, and he has hits, hits at all of those. Obviously, the important ones are spots one and two. So He's got those in spades, yeah. Correct. Uh, do you want to jump back to the draft itself and see, yeah. see what else is going on there? Yeah, I think uh, we should definitely take a look at the draft just because there's a lot of uh, consequences for Mason's deck and others throughout there. And, and Mason, yeah, Mason had a... Mason had a fun spot where he was mostly uncontested because he kind of found his lane and got out of the way. Uh, somebody who didn't had also, I think, had a really close record and similar quality deck as Jeff Blyden. Absolutely. I was really impressed with with Jeff's deck and mm-hmm. Jeff's just per- general performance in, in the draft, right? I thought he played very well in the games that I watched him play. Agreed. Um, you know, the... the change in how he applied his discord his discard spells that sort of uh, led to his downfall <laughs> oh. in one particular match being being sort of the you know from a results oriented perspective maybe the exception to that but overall i thought his his change in mindset was was a, a reasonable one right it was wild to, to hear him just literally right before the right before that match say yeah i want to use these spells defensively or i'm about to go off to clear hands right not cast it and have it cost him the game <laughs> For a really high stakes one, it was really tough to see. Yeah, it's one of those things where I think that you have to. It's 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 yet another yet another entry in the 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 tale of who's the beatdown, right? Except in yeah. sort of a, a a a hand attack world where you're trying you're you're a combo deck. You know that your opponent's deck in this case it was Cody's, right? Mm-hmm. Has this explosive combo potential in the form of of a time vault combo, and you try to figure out okay. What is their potential to go off before me, and how does that impact how I use my discard spells? I think that's something that people don't necessarily think about as much as maybe they ought to in mm-hmm. VRD, and I think Jeff talking about that is going to increase the awareness of that, which I think is great. Yeah, I think you're spot on. So Jeff Jeff's deck, I think, ended up at a 5-2, uh, despite him playing very well and drafting very well, in large part because Alec kind of step, stepped on him, right? Like yes. He, he really just didn't blink and kept sitting on this Jace Wielder of Mysteries that I think Jeff was planning on taking to the 30th or somewhere around that round. Um, similarly, like staying in and taking the inverter combo when you already have somebody else on the uh already have somebody else that is running the consultation package is a pretty bold position right paradigm yeah. shift is a tough card to to take there and that was an interesting thing did, was that was that a consecutive wheel did he pick jace into paradigm shift there he did yeah so that's a real statement that i'm i'm just going to i'm i'm going to 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 squat in your home, basically in this draft <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna blow up your spot had they and, and that was after Jeff took Demonic Consultation. Yeah. Uh, that, and then the next chance that he could, Alec took those two cards, which is absolutely, you're right, just stamping it out. And this is after Thassa's Oracle was taken like six rounds earlier. Yeah. Jeff was really trying to lay claim to this deck very early. Jeff wanted to put on the blinders, as far as I can underst- as, as I can tell, at the beginning of this draft, and just say, I'm going to pick these cards in this, this approximate order, mm-hmm. and nobody else should really be interested if everyone else is acting... You know, from if I were Jeff, I would be frustrated because I would feel like Alec was not acting rationally necessarily. Right? You better believe that Jeff was frustrated. <laughs> he was, he was, I believe, shouted like, "How do you make that pick?" at the at the table in that moment. I, I think also when when Jeff picked that thought lash, I remember hearing a lot of noise outside the in the draft room, and, and what I remember being told was basically Jeff picked thought lash, which is a card that you know. If you know what it does, you know that it is for this Thassa's Oracle style combo. You're you're trying to exile your library on purpose by not paying its cumulative upkeep, right? Correct. Um, and Alec, when when Jeff picked that card, Alec asked, "What is that? What does that <laughs> oh, no. do?" And Jeff was like, mm. "He was frustrated." Yeah. And I thought Lash, I mean, has has he played other areas as well back in the day? But no, you're you're obviously right. 
Right. Steven pointing out that the lo- the Dan Zielinski dream crushing Jeff out of that six <laughs> one position for the last round really sealed it. Like otherwise, we'd have these two decks in finals against each other, and, yeah. and Mason was able to get undisputed as a result of. Uh, otherwise, we would have had to play out. We always play the finals. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, because because Dan dream crushed it. Uh, Jeff's deck doesn't have a great answer to something like like a, a beat down by some uh, some infecting creatures. Did Mason beat? uh jeff in the swiss uh let's let's actually jump over to the standings and see that i don't i don't know the answer to that um but okay the standings don't tell us that at all so that's not helpful <laughs> in any way uh but what i can do is probably track it down somewhere we can we can find out for sure somewhere yeah but i think that um yeah right there you see you know mason mason right at the top with with dan and jeff right behind them with dan of course ahead on that that tiebreaker of well, I beat Jeff head to head, therefore. But let's see if we can find. We've got Jeff here. Yeah, who who's the one loss that Mason had? I think is probably the actual question. Mason lost two. Uh, Mason lost to Jeff. To Jeff. Wow. That's, wow. And, and, and a and a convincing two zero as well. Yeah, I think that would be sort of a difficult matchup for Mason's deck because there's mm-hmm. it's. Jeff's deck is so dense yes, with and combo redundant. pieces and redundancy that I think it would be very hard for Mason to line up enough counter magic mm-hmm. to deal with all of it, right? It's it's a tough matchup. Well, and it's ridiculous, right? Because Mason kind of has two choices, right? One, you drop in creatures and try to pressure uh, life total while getting uh, cards back from Ninja of the Deep Hours and things like that. Mm-hmm. Or you hold up counter magic. If you play the creatures, that means you're tapping out and aren't going to have your counter magic and Jeff can just get you on turn two or three. If you instead go for I'm going to hold back counter magic, he's going to rip your hand apart with, uh, with, uh, with unmask, with duress, him to Turok like your hand grief. He has he has like six great discard spells that he can use to rip your hand apart if you choose to try to go with that. And Jeff also has some powerful defensive tools outside of the discards as well. He's got miscast, which is mm-hmm. fantastic in a matchup like that. Uh, he's got you know again the repeat power of Cabal Therapy. He has Mystical Dispute out of the sideboard, and then he has Mana Maze, which is just a, oh, a wild card. Um, the idea that you know if I play a blue spell, <laughs> I'm gonna lock you out of playing blue spells. Right, no counter spell for you. Yeah, and this is, is if if I understand correctly, this is like a Jeff Blyden pet card. Oh yeah, he for plays this very purpose. DH. Yeah, he plays he plays it in competitive EDH for sure. Uh, but yeah, Man- Mana Maze, again, just like Thought Lash, the first time we've ever seen it here in this deck. <laughs> uh, but co- this is the first time Consultation has happened in, in VRD in St. Louis, St. Lotus. Obviously, Consultation has been taken in other, in other drafts. Um, but it, it's really cool to see this deck that a lot of people have speculated is the best combo in the format, uh, potentially even better than a Time Vault, now that Thassa's Oracle exists. Uh, this might be the best in the format, but obviously not picked very often. Right. The idea that we have this very powerful combo deck mm-hmm. that is so strong in, in CEDH, which is a format that I think bears probably the most similarities to VRD out of any other you know mainstream format. I think you could argue Canadian Highlander, but yeah, one of those two probably. It's, it's one of those two, and I don't, I don't know the point system in the meta of Canadian Highlander well enough to say what Demonic Consultation and Thassa's Oracle's effect on that format is, but I do know that in CEDH, uh, you know, Thoracle combo is an absolutely huge piece of that meta game, right? Yes. Something that people really just have to deal with. And it's, it's kind of interesting to see how you get, get to VRD, um, because some people might be very familiar with this card. Oh, hey, thanks for the subscribing there, uh, Kyle. That's really Kyle, nice. Kyle, thank you. Um, so yeah, if, if you come to this format through CEDH, which a lot of people, like obviously Thurston, have done, um, then yeah, Consultation's probably top of mind. If you came through Vintage or Legacy, Consultation's probably not even something you're really <laughs> thinking about, because it's banned in Legacy. Yeah, right? absolutely so it's not, not on your radar. Exactly. Um, but no, it's, it's cool to see this happen. Uh, Inverter of Truth uh, set came out of the sideboard a lot when he wanted more redundancy. Um, I don't know. Jeff, Jeff's deck, I think, despite not winning the tournament, I think it's the one that I think is going to be most tra- most influential going forward. I mean, yeah. Mason's deck showed us the power of creatures. We've already seen that through a bunch of other things. Yeah. Um, whereas Jeff's deck just showed us, like, here is the, the way to draft this combo deck, even if somebody's fighting you. Yeah, I think that that's a... The, the, the fact that, that Jeff did so well, despite the fact that Alex was just directly in you know he was he, he he saw jeff swimming in that lane in the pool at the gym and said that looks like a good lane i'll get in and just swim at you and we'll see what happens exactly <laughs> exactly right uh so 
Should we take a look at some of the the picks that that were sort of contested between Jeff and Alex? I know we That's Alex and we call. talked about some of them, uh-huh. um, like the Jace and the paradigm shift. But I think a lot of some some of the things that probably could have been useful for Jeff were obviously some of these cheap counter spells, right? Dispel okay. going in round nine that seems unusually high to me. Uh, yeah, I, I remember Dispel being in the low teens or something. No, okay, wow, way low. So twenty seven is where it normally shows up. Right, and I, that felt like sort of a reaction to Jeff taking miscast I think the round previously um, that's also high for miscast yes but definitely something that Jeff needed to, wanted to prioritize a little higher yes just because he's got this this very linear combo deck that he wants to have the cheapest possible interaction with right sure and I think that's the, an important piece of that puzzle you know going three rounds later taking mystical dispute as early as he did speaks yeah. to that as well the mystical dispute I think has gone started to go up more and more in these these pick estimations especially as as we see you know six blue drafters every draft right yeah that's I think that's exactly it right we start we see more and more blue players at the table mm-hmm. so Al- Alex deck obviously didn't perform particularly well this time. Um, going to 07, he, he had a lot of interesting things going on. It seemed kind of like it got pulled in a bunch of different directions, right? So he had this like mill package with, uh, with Ashiok somewhat, uh, but then Archive Trap, Fractured Sanity, Sanity Grinding. And that felt like it was like, that was a good plan that had a lot of potential. But then it kind of got lost and pulled into this high tide pick around picks 37. I think that's, the, for me, if I'm looking at this, I'm like, okay, you have a hyper-controlling deck that has a mill finish. That part makes sense, kind of up through picks 25. After that point, I think he saw red was wide open and wanted to go into that lane, um, but then kind of didn't actually end up playing most of those cards. Yeah, his deck, I think, is... is He just gets pulled in different directions, despite being a pretty uh, good collection of cards. Let's see if we can find it here. Oh, that, that last one on the far ah. right. Yeah, it, it felt like uh, Alec just fell victim to being sort of too flexible, uh, in the last 20, 25 picks of the draft sure. and kind of over-engineered his main deck, right? Because if we look at, at the sideboard, we see you know some cards that, that often go, show up in the sideboard, Reb and Pyro, although, again, Dom did play those in the main deck to, to great effect. Yep. But it seemed like we were dra- we drafted you know pieces of this other, like you say, hyper-controlling deck that ended up in the sideboard and just we, we ended up with some cards that didn't quite make maybe as much sense in the main deck because... Alec wanted to stick to this mill plan mm-hmm. that he had drafted. And I think that if he had focused a little more on that that hyper-controlling mill plan with this Shark Typhoon backup, right? Yep. And and drafted uh, fewer car fewer copies of telepathy, perhaps, which I, I you know, he did admit, all right, this was not <laughs> this was not it, right? That's we, how you learn though. We 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 make mistakes and we learn, but I think drafting the the Shark Typhoon backup plan. And the paradigm shift, Jace kill, mm-hmm. and you know cards like Malevolent Hermit, a card that I appreciate but should not have gone nearly as high as it did. It should get played though. I think I think oh, that yeah. card is good. No, I, I drafted that in an online VRD, and in, although I didn't do particularly well in that draft, I think that it is a good. Yeah, round twenty four is maybe even a little early, right? Mm-hmm. I can probably get that card in round thirty five in most drafts, but that's a you know seal of mana leak is a reasonable card and. In a deck like Mason's, that's something that you might be interested in. So if, if you're going to build a mill deck, uh, I, like, I don't think anyone's really like figured it out yet. Mm-hmm. Cards like Mindspring and Prosperity are very interesting ones to me. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know if I love them. I, th- I think it kind of feels like drafting a fireball and that like you either want to have a one huge hit that doesn't cost all your mana, mm-hmm. uh, kind of like a Archive Trap or something like that, and or you'd want to have something that's more... Uh, like continuous right so psychic corrosion for instance yeah, which but mostly like a little more on on what you'd want and he's got the psychic corrosion the court of cunning the sphinx's tutelage right he's got yes. some of these very consistent mill tools he did miss out on tasha's hideous laughter which got taken by dan yes. uh, which is a much better card than something like mind spring or prosperity when you're looking at a mill deck right mm-hmm. the we've got a lot of these decks that are very low to the ground have a really low average mana value and then, you know, when, when you take into account the fact that the Tasha's exiles the cards yes. and, and can sort of just randomly break some of these powerful combo decks just by saying, oh, I took, took out half of two of your combos. Sorry. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's a, an incredibly powerful 
piece of you know high roll potential for the mill deck who which can often lose to those two card combos mm -hmm. so that's actually a great transition let's, let's take a look at at dan's list then so dan obviously like kind of fell into this uh this mill plan at the very end mm -hmm. taking uh persistent petitioners pick 45th it looks like yes uh, and then sorceress sight which is just a, a fun little uh, fun little choice there peak to this time it's personal right yeah. I, do, I genuinely i know you made fun of it but i really do like this art though like folios don't miss when they do art it's very it's a very folio piece of art yes and if if you enjoy their art style and i absolutely do mm -hmm. it's really cool i just think that a lot of the portal art is kind of goofy it is goofy and this fits right into the the portal art direction of like look, look at these these goofy eyeballs some wizard has taken the time to sculpt <laughs> these magical eyebrows yes. out of the ether right and that really that really gets me i feel good about, <laughs> about that As, yeah right the fact that there's like like eye bags below the eyes is <laughs> just really amazing <laughs> Uh, but for this petitioners, this is the first time we've seen them drafted. We've right. seen the Wrath drafted, I think, twice at this point. Yes. Um, this is not a card that you're probably going to have to fight over, but it worked really well. I think he played it in something like six or seven different matches. He transformed into it at one of the games. Yeah. Because it just throws off your opponent completely, and like, yeah, they, they bring in all their kill spells for uh, Infect, and all of a sudden, you're just like, all right, I don't need to worry about counter spells anymore. I have a lot of copies of this card. Yeah, the idea that you just get to play basically an entire deck mm -hmm. out of this one card, it's so threatening because it makes your opponent make these, like, very difficult sideboard decisions, right? And obviously, yes. if you're Dan, if you're at the table, the first thing that you do when you go to sideboard is you shuffle in all of your copies of persistent petitioners into your deck, Correct. and then you take a bunch of stuff out. Was it the petitioners? Was it not? Who knows? Now your opponent has to play this terrible, terrible mind game with you. Right. And that's just that's just such a, a, a psychologically harmful thing for your opponents at that point. And combined with the Tasha's hideous laughter, it's and, and a lot of the, the counter magic that he has, the, some of the defensive counter spells that he has, like Test of Talents, and even even the Planeswalkers, if you wanted to bring those in, that can be a very interesting transformation. Mm -hmm. um, the core of his deck, though, was that was that Infect deck that he did so well with, at uh, that he won St. Lotus 2 with, Correct. right? A very similar deck, something that he also plays in Modern, if I understand correctly. Oh, interesting, yeah. Um, but it was, it's, his deck in particular, I think was really interesting, uh, because he also had things like Uro, right? Mm -hmm. Like he had a lot of like different choices. Um, also the thing I loved about his transformative sideboard is not that he, he, he didn't pull in everything and have all the persistent, persistent petitioners. I think he played 15 of them, but kept a lot of the core of counter magic and things in the deck. Yeah. So it was, it was a, it was a different way of doing that transformative sideboard that wasn't fully committed. You didn't lose out on all your good spells. So. Right. You still get to play your your test of talents, your miscalculation, mm -hmm. your Oko, right? You gotta you gotta still play your Oko, your mental misstep. Spell Pierce uh, went went pretty high. Uh, Disrupt I saw perform quite well uh, for him, being this you know this this draw a card force spike for instance in sorcery is just just a fantastic piece of cantrip and counter magic that that keeps keeps things going for you, but. The core of this deck again being this this infect deck. Yes. It's just a very a very powerful deck that can can kill you ex extremely quickly with cards like Berserk, Scale Up, and then the defensive cards like Vines of Vastwood that also add to the power and toughness total, right? Yes. That's kind of an incredible, you know, when when you're dealing with a creature like Plague Mirror or or Icker Claw Mirror, Blighted Agent that just looks like this one one garbage card, it 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 gets really powerful very quickly when your when your opponent's life total is halved. The the one card that I think was fantastic that I don't actually know if it got played. It's in the sideboard here. This card seemed very cool to me. This is a very interesting piece of the infect puzzle because it creates this base power and toughness four three mm -hmm. that is a copy of your glistener elf of your blighted agent whatever and it has flying. It's got that extra piece of invasion if you're not copying the agent right. And crew one is just. It's perfect for the Infect deck because that is the power and toughness of all of your creatures unless they are also a Gem Razor. <laughs> right. True. Yeah, Gem, gem Razor being able to uh, jump things up. Like, Scale Up and Gem Razor are really cool ones. Um, I don't think Scale Up actually got taken in this one, right? Oh, no, no Scale Up did. I'm yeah, sorry. Scale Up, you know, all the classics, the Scale Up, the Rancor, Mutagenic, Might of Old 
Carosa, Groundswell, Vines, oh, yeah. all of the and Invigorate, of course, another another fantastic best, free yeah. spell for these infect decks. All of these classic pieces that no one else wants. Yes, right. No one in their right mind wants Invigorate if they are not drafting this exact this exact type of deck. Right. And this is where, like, you can see it in round 28, but you also see it as a tiny Lotus score because it was only played in 16 of 64. Right. right. Uh, yeah, common opponent calls out that it's a it's low threat density, that if they can answer all of your infect creatures, then you just are out of luck, which is fair. But I think that's where you see a lot of these, like, disrupt and fluster storm. Like, you just get to draft a blue deck. Sometimes you draft a Teferi and a Solitude that you end up not playing because you get pushed out of that lane. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you still end up being able to play spell pierces. Yeah, the idea there are so many good counter spells, right? Mm -hmm. That this format can support that you can go down to something like a disrupt, which we see this round thirty three, very low lotus score, right? Does not get picked mm -hmm. more than a third of the time, really. But but is powerful in a deck like this that just wants to spend the first couple of turns playing a glistener elf putting some nonsense on it, and then stopping you from killing it on the critical turn. Right. Temio's Safekeeping was a card that we talked about potentially seeing play here instead mm -hmm. of the Blossoming Defense, but obviously the plus two plus two in this deck is just so much better. Uh, it's just, it's not even close in this case for the Indestructible. Yeah, so. I think Temio's Safekeeping is kind of kind of an edge case card for this deck. If if you're up against some kind of weird Gruul deck and they take Blossoming Defense, right? If Brandon is in your in your draft and he decides that it's Bloodbraid Elf, you know, it's it's the Bloodbraid Elf holiday this week, exactly. then then you might end up with Tamio Safekeeping instead of the the Blossoming Defense. But I think usually you're going to want this card. Totally. So for uh, for anybody, there was nobody really fighting Dan for this uh, after the after he went for the the tenth round or whatever and got pushed off of White. Um, what else was kind of going on around that point? Like, who, who was he fighting for that white deck? So that was interesting because a lot of the white that he might have wanted to fight for mm -hmm. was a little bit speculative at that point, right? We see Mason going into this very controlling deck and Dan starting to think, hmm, maybe I'm not going to have the cards I need to finish this out. Uh, we see Sam at that point had not really taken a lot of the controlling white pieces, right? That, that might be interesting for a deck. Uh, that 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 you might want to play for for Dan's uh, planeswalkers, right? right. Um, the Karn getting snapped up by Brandon is a is a small casualty, but not something huge. I think it was mostly just seeing all of these the Everyone powerful. Blue. Yeah, everyone's in blue. The the really powerful control counter spells have been taken, and more of the aggressive counter spells are are what's available. So and and that doesn't really pair well with the planeswalkers, right? And I think sure. that might have been a lot of what factored into Dan's decision here. That makes sense. The, the player who did go heavily into white, though, Sam, in her yes. first in-person VRD, I think her third one overall, her deck was fantastic. I think her drafting was really, really wonderful. Um, she ended up with a 1-6 record. Like, obviously, her story is that she, this is her first time playing uh, Paper Magic, I believe. Like, she's mm -hmm. done cubes and things like that. But, like, VRD is her primary entry to Magic the Gathering, which is a wild spot to come in. <laughs> uh, so, so I think that, like, it was great to see her win the match uh, when, when she did. And uh, we saw her like play well on camera. Um, I, I was I, I was so hoping she would defeat Brandon on stream. That yeah. match against Brandon, where it came down to what one card in his library versus none in hers. They both had one card in their library <laughs> on her turn. And if she if she drew a uh, if if she drew um, what was it? She she had a, a rogue. If she drew a rogue, the game's over and it mills right. the last card. Oh, it was wild. And she drew the plow the plowshares that she needed to have like. What was it? Four turns. <laughs> any, any time in the last four turns, and she would have won the game. Yeah, uh, that was that was tragic. But I thought I thought she drafted really well. And as someone who appreciates a good Thalia, right? Yeah. You know, we know from VRD seven. I love a good Thalia. This is the kind of deck that I'm I'm very interested in. I have a list that's very similar to this in my my Google Drive, right? Mm -hmm. um, for it's the forty two shades. Nice. It's that one. <laughs> So looking at this list, a lot of the cards that I think are, are very interesting are actually one of my favorite things about this list is Scepter Chant, right? Yeah, that last pick, Orem's Chant, was very cool. Yeah, because the, the Isochron Scepter goes so well with a lot of other cards that you can slot into this deck. Cards like, you know, you, you can put a Vanishing Verse on it, you can put a Disenchant on it, you can put a Fracture on it, what have you. But the idea that you can simply put Orem's Chant on a Scepter yep. and, and just lock people out of the game is, is so ridiculous. Now, obviously, we don't have, we have 
what we have the demonic tutor a lot of the other tutors did get snapped up pretty quickly by sure. jeff mm -hmm. um which may have hurt the scepter chant plant a little but i don't think you want to go too hard on it i think this is about you know just having a dt and being like all right if i have one piece i can find the other is fine well and yeah scepter like chant by itself can be good because you can interrupt a combo player yes. on, on their own turn if you don't happen to have the scepter also scepter is pretty good in her deck even if you don't have that right you have to be careful a little bit that you don't just get it abraded right away right but, like you said right she has so many cards like unexpectedly absent and vanishing verse that it's completely fine to... <laughs> unexpectedly absent scepter it's so silly i love yeah, it yeah <laughs> it's just really great um <laughs> Yeah, I've not seen Scepter actually get drafted in one of these things in any kind of reasonable way, and right. it was really cool to see it work out well. Yeah, that's a card that just gets picked late because people are like, Isochron Scepter, that's a good card, and yeah. it languishes in somebody's sideboard, and we're all a little sadder because of it. But I think that a lot of the... A lo I, I really liked the the rogue synergies in this mm -hmm. deck. I thought that was very interesting. The Unis Blackguard, the Thieves Guild Enforcer, uh, the Tiny Bones, uh, and the Bitter Blossom, of course, pumping out Fairy Rogues. Yes, um, Bitter Blossom, uh, Skull Clamp is obviously the classic. That's yep. incredible. Um, but yeah, it, it just like you're right. It had it had a lot of extra little synergies that played along with it. Uh, the the Paladin class. I know you got very excited about it on stream. Uh, the thing I wanted to, I was like very excited to discuss was why Orm's Chant versus Silence. How do you make that decision in a world where miscalculation is actually drafted? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, no nobody wanted to have that conversation with me. No, that's which is a, understandable. <laughs> but that's that is a tough one, right? And that was a, a decision that I've had to make in one of the online VRDs when I was drafting mm -hmm. that like glass cannon artifact Zerta thing. Um, the idea that, you know, you can get your chant miscalculated onto you, which did happen. Did it really? actually happened. Oh, man. Um, she assembled Scepter Chant against Jeff, mm -hmm. who then, when he got chanted in his upkeep, misdirected the chant at her and then won that turn. That's 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 exactly it wow yeah. like that that actually occurred so that is a discussion of value to have right how early did did jeff take miscalculation it was it was pretty early it, we normally don't actually who? see it I, I don't think it was jeff sorry uh, who was it but it, oh no sorry he miscast it that's what it was okay he miscast it but the dan so, dan took miscal dan took mis not miscal what a, misdirection misdirection is the card we're thinking of mason took misdirection okay that might also have happened I don't remember. I remember Jeff playing a blue spell that started with miss, and it turns out it was miscast. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, which spell, I, I, I missed all the spells apparently, but but regardless, that is something that could very well have occurred. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this this draft was one where we also saw the courts actually yes. do things. Uh, court of Ambition, obviously, in this deck, but we also had the blue court out, mm -hmm. out of the mill deck. Um, these cards have seen a lot of play, uh, not this one in particular, but other courts have seen play on online drafts, and yes. it's... it's it's interesting to see Monarch start to kind of creep up. Yeah, that's so. something that has, has come up in Pauper a lot, right? The Monarch cards being very, very powerful in these these one-on-one -on -one formats where yep. you can assemble a board advantage and then play one of these cards that gives you, gives you the Monarch token, and then you just draw an extra card of return. And the idea that, you know... Phyrexian Arena in this format by itself, probably not the thing you want to be doing, but when it comes coupled with another effect like this, it becomes a lot more powerful. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, cool. So let's let's jump back to the actual draft itself. Uh, we also had uh, we had Sam's for first blue black draft uh, deck there, obviously, and the other person sitting just to her right, uh, Andrew. So Swifty was was on this really cool Alluren list. Yeah, Swifty told I was talking to Swifty before the tournament started, and he told me that this was his plan. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I talked to him after the the first fifteen picks, right? And 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 we we sat here and we talked about the fact that he was he was about to take, uh, you know, he was we were going to come back and he was going to take this. Uh, I, I think I think he took Birthing Pod right before the break. Actually, I think that was oh, okay. his his pick that that really got him into the booth uh, right at round yeah, sixteen. There it is, and so. Swifty, Swifty sat in the seat that Mason often finds himself in, right? The sixth seat, mm -hmm. and decided, all right, I'm going to take, you know, made the, made the interesting decision, I thought, right off the top, to take Emerald into Thoughtseize, sure. where I think, you know, if, if he had been going full, you know, Mason imitation, he would have taken Jet into Thoughtseize here. <laughs> of course. But the fact that he went Emerald into Thoughtseize, Inquisition, Delta, Catacombs, yeah. speaks to his, his idea that, like, you know, I see all of these other people drafting blue, right? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna 
lock down these powerful black discard spells early. Yes. And I'm going to be black X. And whatever X is doesn't bother me so much. Which was interesting with him sitting next to Demonic Tutor, Douthy Voidwalker, Opposition Agent, Marsh Flats from yes. Sam, right? She's also trying to claim some of that real estate. But, but yeah, I think this goes to like, Swifty doesn't necessarily want to be... He wanted to have the two black discard spells. Um, but the fact that he took an emerald over a jet there is actually, I think, signaling that early on he knew he wanted to be black green. Yeah. He wanted, he not only did he want to be black green, but, you know, the thing that we've left unsaid this entire time by accident, he wanted to play this Aluren deck. Sure, yeah. Because Aluren, of course, has this new powerful interaction from AFR with Aserac the Archlich, right? I'm so happy we finally got to see it happen. <laughs> right, this card is just so. You know, this this is something that, you know, I've been on the receiving end of in in multiple uh, Sephiroth decks, right? Mm -hmm. Both Steven and my friend Jason, I've, I've seen do, do this out of Sephiroth and just like, I'm going to, I'm going to play this card over and over again and ruin, you know, just, just sort of ruin your life. Yep. Um, but the fact that you can simply do it infinitely with a learn, well, not infinitely per se, but you can run through the Lost Mine of Fandelver and go to the dark pool room and drain your opponent for one. Yes. Um, and then, you know, of course, when you get to the Lost Mine, of, at the end of the Lost Mine of Fandelver, you draw a card. Yes. Uh, so you need to have the requisite number of cards. I don't think it's in the thing. Yeah, fair enough. But uh, you have to have the requisite number of cards in your deck when you get to the end of the, the dungeon to be able to go through enough times. But as long as you have enough cards in your deck to drain all their life, you've won the game. And that did actually come up. Is Swifty didn't have enough cards, so he had to go through it several times until he had like one or two cards left in his library and then go through uh go through the other dungeon for a while to actually make to to, to like scry about i forget what the other dungeon was but yeah he had to like go through losing some life and creating a giant four four. Oh, he had to go he had to actually go through the tomb of annihilation correct because he was going to kill himself play Aserac the normal way <laughs> yes exactly um also we got to see Aluren just have the kind of heartbreak that Aluren always has Oof, where it yeah. makes you lose to your own Aluren. Um, somebody else playing, comboing off in response to you. Yeah, Mason um, Mason beat him notably with his Aluren. Yes. Yeah, it, it's really cool to see. Common says Aluren's a great card to see because it's a showcase of these old gadgets. And yeah, I, I totally agree. Even playing things like Cavern Harpy that are just like so endemic to the idea of what of what Aluren is. Right, and the fact that he backs up his Aluren plan, not just with, you know, he's got the Cavern Harpy stuff, he's got the the, the newer stuff, the Aserac, right? But also he he possesses this this beautiful pod chain. Yeah. Right. The pod you know, is so cool. That's something you never see in this format. Right. Going from veteran explorer up to to Fibble Thip, up to Renegade Rallyer, to, you know, Corridor Monitor and, uh, to untap the uh, the pod, right? Little synergies like that, carrying him forward a little further into the pod combo and ending up on, you know, a Malira Murderous Red Cap loop. Exactly. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of ways to do that, right? Like, you, the Fibble Fib drawing you two cards is obviously, like, if you're going with a value, uh, value pod chain, yes. uh, it works really well. But, yeah, you, you can kind of just, like use corridor monitor and like bounce back through and have two consecutive chains going at the same time too and just easily fall back into the fall into the the combo there with renegade rally or and stuff like that and if you're somehow shut out of your of your malira combo or if it's faster to do you have the right cards in your hand you can go ahead and get academy rector and then sack the rector to the birthing pod go get a learn and so on and so forth right it's got this sort of cross cross synergy redundancy aspect that that makes these two sort of these two decks that sort of aren't quite enough, I think, on mm -hmm. their own. Something that has a little more, some more legs to it, I think. Yeah, I mean, the the hard part about Aluren is that traditionally it's a four color deck, and you can't really do that in this format, so you have to settle for three, um, which still ends up okay. Yeah, but it means that you're never going to be casting your Renegade Rallyer or your Academy Rector unless you kind of go for the city of brass deal which he did but not not very hard right it wasn't he didn't intend to be a four color deck yeah the well we've got the the mana confluence and then the the savannah and the scrubland here yeah. to make white mana and not much else savannah and scrubland of course fetchable off the overgrown tomb sure. uh, scrubland fetchable off the delta um and the the bayou as well he's got sort of that absan uh trio as well as the the zagoth triome to get the blue mm -hmm. can pretty much fetch any color he needs most most of the time um 
of course the the Baseju ending up you know I want to want to touch on some of the neo cards here the Baseju mm -hmm. getting put in this deck a very powerful card in a great way to sort of shove some interaction in this deck without compromising the uh, <laughs> the core of the deck which is totally uninterested in what your opponent is doing most of the time <laughs> agreed I, this is a deck that you could let, kind of look at the sideboard and it looks like the problem that often happens in verities where there's a lot of these cards that like you traditionally would not think of as sideboard cards like baleful strix gloom shrieker even endurance is a card that could easily be in the main deck um questing beast there's just like this feels like a deck that you get excited, you go a little too far down and end up with a sideboard that's full of cards that could be in your main deck. Yeah, this is a very common problem, right? You know, and we've all done it. You know, you and oh, I have both done this where we've many times. We've we've over engineered our main deck. We've got this list of cards that we want, you know, we've got them in priority order, and oh my gosh, this lane is so open and we can draft all of these cards and we get to the end of the draft. Well, where are my sideboard tools? Exactly. <laughs> I just have worse cards in my sideboard that I'll never board in. That's exactly what happens. That's the wrong thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, seeing a learn pot happen was fantastic. Yes, yes. So, uh, Brandon, I think is kind of, it's real sad to see uh, going off of a win into a spot where he's not guaranteed to be in the next draft. Right. right. There's a good chance he will be, um, but obviously it's not a guaranteed spot unless you make the top two. So, uh, we'll, we'll see. But Brandon's deck, it seemed like it was fine, but it kind of fell into this mid-range, uh, did, didn't really have a clear path, and then had a bunch of two-card combos. So right. So could easily win, and we saw him win a lot, uh, but he didn't He didn't get up into the 5-2-6-1 range that he would need to. Right. It was it was, it was was much easier for people to sort of get under him with yes. this, this draft than, than sometimes it is, and he didn't have that backup plan of the, like, well, I'm going to take over the late game with Planeswalkers because Dan had sort of eaten all of those, yes. right? Dan had eaten a lot of the cards, the Oko, the Teferi, uh, th that stuff that, that Brandon might otherwise have wanted to prioritize because, well, he prioritized fast bond in some of these land tools. So he ended up on this channel Emrakul plan, right? Um, which served him well quite a few times. And as well as the, he had the, the other combo, right? He had... He had Thespian Stage Dark Depths, which yes. is obviously very strong. Uh, he did take the Dress Down, which I'm sure Jeff uh, really would want with that, with the Phyrexian Dreadnought. Mm -hmm. Uh and then he had this strange crab combo as well. I don't even know if that was a combo so much. It was the fast bond of Boro crab thing. Yes, I did see him turn one. I think it was Swifty off camera with fast bond, a Boro crab. Mm -hmm. You know, and and just enough enough lands to to get the job done. Basically, that was that was a turn one kill, right? Yes, yes. At, like Swifty had not. Swifty was not afforded the opportunity to play a card or take a game action. Yes, it was. It was simply I am going to end end your library. Go ahead. Yep. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty cool to see, but yeah, not. It, it felt like there were a lot of different combos, and it wasn't. He didn't have the protection to guarantee that he could stop the other decks if they got underneath them. That's so. the thing we see. We have we have very little counter magic. We have very little you know on board interaction with with creatures, mm -hmm. right? So if somebody like Mason is says I'm going to counter your critical spell and play a creature, right? That's often going to be enough to just put Brandon very far behind, if not if not win the game outright. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a Vendillion click or a Brazen Bar was kind of a nightmare for this deck. Totally. And, and he has answers, right? He can do like Reality Smasher out of the sideboard is very strong against that kind of plan. But again, these are like cards that could easily be in the main deck sitting in the sideboard ready to come in. Right. Uh, and it could potentially be a more reactive deck if you're doing that. So yeah, I wonder I wonder how many times there was a channel into Hexdrinker type deck. Because uh, I feel like it feels like there's a lot of times that I saw him uh, sitting there top decking and just like hoping to draw a card, but instead drawing kind of uh, some mana, right? Mm -hmm. Drawing dry a Black Lotus or Lotus Petal or Mana Ball, right? And they, these are great cards, but not exactly what you need. And you're running 18 lands in addition to all those cards. So. That's one of the issues with a fast bond deck is you're priced into running this this high land count, especially when you have Thespian Stage Dark Depths, Dark Depths being, you know, usually a fake land. He doesn't have Yavamaya to turn that into something that generates mana, right? Sure. So that's, that's one of the issues is that you're going to draw air in the mid game a decent amount of the time. But other times you're going to have a Crucible strip mine lock, and yeah. that's that's a lot of fun. So I, this seems like an incredibly fun deck, but not necessarily like the most powerful, which is probably explains the record, despite Brandon playing it well. Yeah, the the interesting thing about some of these decks that we've talked about recently, both um, Swifty's deck and I think Brandon's deck as well as a lot of these lands.
plans ended up going very early, right? Mm -hmm. We see Delta and Verdant Catacombs, four and five, Misty and Prismatic Vista, four and five, Marsh Flats, five, Tarn, five, um, C6. Yeah, so Marsh Flats is, is like, Delta goes in round 10 usually-ish. Marsh Flats goes in round 13 and got pushed all the way up to round 5. Because I think right. Sam thought that things were pretty uncontested, and they were for the most part. And I think a lot of these are sort of bubbling up further and further. The, the more we people realize that locking in these powerful lands that allow you to play the deck that you're trying to play fluidly, right? Mm -hmm. Without, you know, losing to your mana base less is very desirable in this format. <laughs> I mean, it's true. And we had a lot of people trying to play lots of different colors. However, we also had weird cases like Aaron Mesa went in round 30 for, for, for Cody. So it was kind of this bifurcated like initial land run where people got too stressed about it and just like reacted by trying to take all their cards that are lands. And then people that didn't do, necessarily do that because they didn't need it as much were able to get rewarded by getting as good of lands 20 rounds later. So, and when everyone else was drafting these other cards, uh, Cody's like, I'll take a Volcanic Island, and then yep. I'll take a Chlorine Academy. I'll just, like, start taking, like, really powerful cards like Ragavan and not having to fight over lands. I thought Mason, in particular, did a really good job just saying, all right, you are all going to take use your picks to take mm -hmm. these lands. I'm going to take a Tarn. Maybe that'll be helpful for me. Maybe it won't. It ended up paying off with Mystic Sanctuaries as well as some other things. But, uh, that's an island? Am I misremembering? Oh, which one? Sorry. Mystic Sanctuary? Is Mystic Mystic, Sanctuary? It is an island. Yeah, okay. So it ended up paying off with cards like Mystic Sanctuary, as well as the uh, you know the, the the ability to play some of those, those white lands as well. Mm -hmm. But while other people are taking these lands, he's just taking powerful blue cards. Right. Just every time you take a land, I'm going to take another powerful blue card. And then eventually I'm going to take Cavern of Souls, for which I will name Wizard or Fairy. Exactly. Um, but but just taking, you know, Gitaxian Probe, Brazen Borrower, Archmage's Charm, Critic Command, and just cementing his claim to just generally blue, and knowing that he can take those man those creature lands later is, you know, if everyone else is doing one thing, and you say, okay, you all fight over that, I'm going to go over here and do my own thing, that worked great for Mason, that worked great for Jeff, other than his, you know, constant battle with Alec. Of course. <laughs> so... The person we haven't talked about yet is Cody in the traditional time vault seat, right? Mm -hmm. Two two and a half years ago when we started this thing. Yes. It was uh it's yeah, when you're in seat three, you go it goes Black Lotus, Essential Recall, Time Vault. And Time Vault gets taken in pick three because you're in the third seat. And technically got taken in the third seat this time, <laughs> but not in pick three. With Soul Ring, Tinker, like all the stuff, and then finally pick ten for Time Vault is a wild a wild divergence from where we were two or three years ago when we started this. Yeah, Reptar and I were kind of freaking out in the booth a little bit, just saying, when when is Time Vault going to be taken? And mm -hmm. furthermore, who's going to take it? Right. Because clearly, Cody wants it at this point. You know, we see the Soul Ring, we see the Tinker, we see the Urza, the Academy. This this has all the makings of a Time Vault, a deck that can use Time Vault while still having a solid core to do things that aren't Time Vault related, right? Exactly. You know? It turns if you draft your whole deck trying to just do a time vault thing, it's not as good as it was a few years ago. Yes, you really, you still know, good. It's still good, but it's not as good. Um, it, it's a little harder to to make that happen. But Cody managing to float the time vault all the way to ten while picking a lot of very powerful cards in the interim: the Ragavan, the Force, the Urza, yep. was just an unbelievable exercise in patience. It, it's really cool to see. And then, then he ended up kind of, uh, let's pull up his deck a minute here, but he ended up with uh, what I think is a really interesting deck that is kind of almost become uh, passe at this point. It's mm -hmm. like, this is the deck that you do when you get Time Vault and when you get Tinker, right? This, this is just the default uh, blue-red artifacts deck. Yeah. That, like, obviously he did interesting things like Fable the Mirror Breaker and Underworld Breach here that aren't necessarily as traditional. But yeah, like if you if you have Tinker, you take Urza and you kind of fall into the Painter Grindstone combo as a result. Like it, These are all just like, yeah, this is the thing that happens when you take this deck. Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like this deck was a little bit more unfocused mm -hmm. than some of the Time Vault decks I've, I've seen in the past. I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying you draft your whole deck around Time Vault, but I'm saying if you draft, if you spend a little more time on just like a general artifact synergy path, mm -hmm. it might be a little easier. Whereas Cody's trying to mill himself for Underworld Breach, right? Yeah. He's, he's trying to cast cards like Otherworldly Gaze and use Lion's Eye Diamond, a card that 
might win you the game or might simply be dead. He's trying to do things with Kappa Cannoneer, like, you know, cast Prismari Command to make treasures. Yeah. You know, that that's Kappa Cannoneer, of course, a, a card that, <laughs> that people are have been very interested in. But Lion's Eye Diamond, right, a lot of the time, this card is just going to sit and not do a lot for him. I, I will give him a lot of credit for drafting the Painter Servant uh, Grindstone combo in a deck Definitely. that has such an ability to, to tutor out artifacts. But, you know, when, you, when you're also trying to do Underworld Breach, Lion's Eye Diamond, Brain Freeze, it, become, <laughs> it becomes a little more complicated. Well, and you can totally see how he gets there, right? He's like, okay, well, I... I, take, I want to go Soul Ring and a Tinker really early on. Okay, now I see that Time Vault's still available. Yeah. Uh, so after I've taken Urza, which is kind of like the default, like we should Tinker into Urza. Now I have like this good artifact deck going. Oh, Time Vault's open. I'll grab that because I can tutor for that pretty easily off of this Tinker. Uh, as long as I have that, it's very easy to get Painter Servant Grindstone. And since I have Urza, let me pick up Lion's Eye Diamond because I can tap it for mana when I don't need it and I can sacrifice it. Right. As long as I have Lion's Eye Diamond, I might as well take Other World Breach. So it's like a very logical progression of just like i have half of a combo i might as well grab the other half uh and you end up with just like you said an unfocused deck that like of course i have underworld breach and lines i diamond so i should take wheel of fortune i should take brain freeze and you just like keep having these logical progressions but as a result it's a super proactive deck you're going to win a lot of games off of that but you're not going to have the control aspects you're not going to stop other people's plans which i think is why i kind of felt this middling middling record um some of that also is to blame on the frenetic free combo they got drafted in the middle here as well. But oh yes, th that's that's a different story. I yeah, think. the the frenetic free tavern you know tavern scoundrel thing of I'm going to flip an arbitrary number of coins and generate some enormous amount of treasures and then make Kappa Cannoneer very large and kill you with it because it's unblockable. Right? right. We have this this sort of hilarious commander card that. Has has improvised and all of these other things. A popper as well, right? Yeah. Or no, not uh, popper. I'm sorry. This is a. It's it shows up in uh, Legacy. Is, okay, is that's the, it's bad. the 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 format where people have been playing it. I don't know that it's any good, but it's very cool. Yes. Um, but we do see some of that, like, you know, I've got this cool thing. Let's add this other cool thing. Let's add this other cool thing. Feature creep issue. Whereas yes. I think if if we had st stuck with a more traditional. Slightly more traditional deck that that Psy could have ended up in the main deck. Right. Um, and we could have just had this plan where we, we have this loaded ground deck that can spam the token the, the token army onto the board or or just play some powerful low end creatures mm -hmm. that are, are cheap artifacts that lead into the Urza, you know, and the paradoxical outcome. We may we may have, you know, a plan A, plan B situation that makes a little more sense than here's plans A through L. Right. Which is what I think we had. I will also note that Fury was very good. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Fury's obviously been tearing it up in legacy and vintage. Um, so it's cool to see that it's kind of received its acclaim in, in VRD as well. Yeah, I mean, a 3-3 a, a three, three double striker is is a reasonable card, right? That's a that's a decent card. Yeah, it's a, probably three turn clock, right? Yeah. Two or three turn. And the idea that you can also just pitch a red card and and delete someone's board effectively mm -hmm. is is very powerful, right? Definitely. Like that, that, and that served him well in a couple of matches. I think one on camera where he played Fury and it just won him the game by itself that is wild uh yeah and, and i love any deck that's running 12 lands don't yeah. get me wrong so like i'm here for this deck but yeah it, it does feel like it it is exactly the thing you described as feature creep i think is, is a good way of calling it out but that's that's all the decks right yeah it was a pretty fun field everyone seemed to really be able to do their thing despite like lots of more fighting than we see everyone's deck came together there's like obviously we have lots of commentary on them but nobody nobody like got lost completely right which is cool to yeah see. If, uh, if you could have like let's let's say that you were in this draft right yes. let's say let's say just just for argument's sake just because he you know he didn't he, it, it didn't work out for alec not no shade to alec he yeah. learned a lot and i talked to him about it i know i know that he he learned a lot of things and he's excited to do more but if you were in alec's seat yes with the benefit of all the hindsight you have mm -hmm. what are you looking to do in this draft in the eighth seat Man, uh, so I think that there's a couple options. The the big one is is red, right? Mm -hmm. Either mono red or goblins or something. But like something in red, if you can just like predict where everyone else is going to go, which obviously you never can, uh, that would be a really that that's that's the spot that I think is most underdrafted. I think there's also an argument for trying to force Brandon off of some of the green mm. and go for go for like a fast mana deck of some kind. I I mean you're fighting Aluren and you're fighting Brandon for it, but I think that there's there's some kind of uh, green black deck that. 
uh, you ignore the counter spells, and instead you're kind of just playing a uh, like abrupt decay, not being drafted as a signal to me. Mm-hmm. I think like you could probably steal the Liliana and get in a little bit of fight with Sam there and force her off of her deck. Uh, that, that also seems very interesting to me. Yeah, you could play a green black, you know, combo. You could play Wither Bloom Apprentice, Chain exactly. of Smog, things like that. You could you could go elves if you see all these counter spells, right? You can draft cards like Allosaurus Shepherd. You can draft Gaia's Herald mm-hmm. and try to combat the counter spells that way with some of those. Uh, you can you can go into to red aggro or, or red black aggro, right? Yeah, I think St- Steven's of, pointing out that yeah, the the red black aggro deck would be very strong. Yes, um, the the big the big loss there, of course, is Swifty taking those uh, the the Inquisition and the Thoughtseize right off the bat. Mm-hmm. Robber of the rich. Yeah, some people like that card. <laughs> some right? people some yeah. people in the chat might like that card more than you do. Uh, Steve, <laughs> Steven does point out though that the breach is if you think of it as a rebuy mechanic for the other parts of the combo, it's very good. Mm. I agree with him for Cody's deck. I just think that you don't then need to be drafting the other pieces of brain freeze and things if that's actually your mindset. Right, you just use it as a redundancy object. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. I like that a lot more than trying to go into the combo place with it. Agreed, yeah. So what what would you take from uh, from Alec? I actually love the idea of elves. I didn't even think about that, but elves would be a great spot there in that last seat. Yeah, um, I think if if I had been in this seat, I might have tried to. So I I would have wanted to draft goblins, but again, seeing seeing Swifty take the in a world where Swifty is going to grab those those uh, he's going to get the both the thought sees and the Inquisition before right. I, before I I guess I could like there there's no world in which I don't take two moxes there, right? If two moxes are available to me, I'm gonna I'm gonna grab mox mox. So I'm gonna lose Thought Season Inquisition. So at that point, I think I'm much more incentivized to just try to draft a mono red deck mm-hmm. and try to, and and just start start drafting some of the like some of the cards that I want that other people are just going to take away from me, right? I can take Lutri to, to yes. double up your uh, in your what is it? Not incinerate. What's the What's the um, sack two mountains? My fire somebody. blast, yeah. right? I can take a, a lutri to double double up my fire blast. I can I can take you know the red blasts right. uh, early. I can take some of those card those red cards that get contested you know around picks eight through fifteen, mm-hmm. and then I you know I can take ragavan right if it if it gets to me you know I guess Cody took ragavan seventh so Probably in this not, situation yeah. you know I mean, I mean maybe you take ragavan fourth or fifth right yeah. you know it, it is it is that powerful I think and. And if you're doing that, then yeah, you can draft all of your lightning bolts in garbage time, your Lalia, your Maddening Hex, sure. your Lava Spikes, all of that stuff. You can draft, you know, somewhere between pick 1,000 and next week. <laughs> you know, it doesn't doesn't really <laughs> matter what you do because you get to do, you you, you get to go full fully Jeff Blyden and just say it doesn't, nothing you do matters anymore. And sure, somebody, people are going to, you're going to get core firewalkers. You're going to mm-hmm. get all those, all those things are going to, going to pop that's up fine. at some point. But that's okay. Okay, you know, those cards are beatable generally. Common suggests the idea of doing Grixis by taking three and four with Ragavan Snapcaster and then Confidant on, on the next wheel, Ooh. which seems reasonable. I, I don't know, you're fighting over a lot of, you're fighting over two of the most popular colors in this table, which is tough. It, yeah, I actually don't hate where Alex started off on this mill plan. I, yes. I, I think that that's also a strategy of just taking the counter spells he took, take basically keeping everything up through picks like 35, 30, maybe yeah. somewhere in there. And then just like not diverging off into this high tide plan and just stay with the mill, take counter spells and figure out some way to engulf the shores or something to bounce other people's things. One thing that I would have liked to see with that, that Narset that he took pick four, right? Yeah. We don't have a wheel effect. True. We don't have, you know, we, we don't have wheel of fortune that went to Cody 10th round or something like we that. We do have Talarian wins, which is not quite the same. <laughs> <laughs> not, not quite the same Talarian wins, but you know, getting, getting a... You know, if you're going to be self-milling, get get the Echo of Eons. If you're not going to be self-milling, get the right. Wheel of Fortune. Time Twister's already gone. Uh, Hull Breacher's already gone. So it's a little harder to make something like that happen. But it is definitely doable. Right. Um, and yeah, like take like seeing that the Mana Drain and the Narset are available exactly. and picking those up is absolutely a fantastic plan, right? And then just Flooded Strand, Counterspell... Um, Counterspell is pretty early there. Yeah, so yeah. There's, there's like there's lots of little things I can quibble about, but I think that the idea of I want to be in a hyper blue controlling deck with Mill as the win condition right. seems fine to me. Yeah, that's a totally doable deck mm-hmm. in this in this environment, right? I think that's a a viable deck. You're going to have trouble 
with infect, but you don't know that. <laughs> you exactly, don't know yeah. about that yet. Uh, you probably have some trouble with Sam's deck. But other than that, you're pretty happy overall. Your games with Mason are, are a question mark. Right, yeah. That kind of, yeah. That's very true. It's, I think it's whoever gets more counter spells in hand. Right. You're, you're, so that's a little bit of a coin flip, but you know that that deck is pretty good against this field, right? If you're gonna, if you can magically crystal ball predict the field, right? Right. That's a great deck to go into. So I, I think Alec had had the right idea, mm-hmm. and just may have diverged at a critical point. I think you're right. I also do like his Hall of Storm Giants. I think that's a fantastic, uh, just like win win condition in one card. I don't hate it. I, I, I think getting taking it 33rd, fine. Right. Uh, I just, I'm super speculative about the idea of having seven mana. It just doesn't seem like a thing that's going to be happening. Is it, is it seven mana? It's six to activate and oh, then gosh. Act, attacking with it. For some reason, I thought it was five to activate. I was higher on it. Yeah, I play this in standard a lot. But no, I mean, you'll get there some games. Right? Yeah. I'm not saying never, but it's... It requires a special kind of situation to get there. That's fair. Okay. Maybe I'm, I'm lower on Hall of Storm Giants than I was. I'd be more excited about, you know, all the fairy conclaves and, uh, and, yeah. and Mishra's factories that Mason ended up taking. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, what else is happening? When's the next VRD? Oh, my gosh. The next VRD is, uh, we do these quarterly, so the next one is in August, August 13th, I That's believe. That's right. Yeah. So it's going to be a great time. Obviously, uh, we're going to be asking Mason and uh, Jeff and Dan if they'd like to come back. Uh, so we'll see what the final invite list looks like, but, uh, yeah, it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good field that's going to be coming out. So excited to do this again. We're probably going to run, uh, there's obviously discord drafts happening and probably a new one should be kicking off there pretty soon. Um, and we're probably going to be doing one that we're not going to stream, uh, next month as well. So, or at the end of this month. Yeah. I was going to say that's coming up. (laughs) Yeah. So so in about, in about two or three weeks, we're going to be doing one and we'll we'll probably do commentary about it afterwards. I got to figure out what I'm going to play in that draft. (laughs) That's exactly what I'm thinking about. I'm not going to lie. I'm looking at some of the decks here for inspiration. Oh, definitely. That's the great part about this is there's so much information. If you, you know, if you go to the discord, if you go to these, these archive sheets, there's so much information out there, whether it's from talking to other players, looking through these archives, looking at past coverage on 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 St. Lotus. There's a lot of information for you to digest. It, and if you if if you want to take a deep dive into this, you can learn a lot. And there's that that VRD Discord invite right in the uh, right in the chat for you if you're not in there yet. Mm-hmm. Also, yeah, there's lots of articles on stlotus.org, which is where the links to all these things, including the Discord, live. Uh, so yeah, check those out. Uh, the Dom that Dom's that just got posted about how he won with that blue red spells deck and why the time walk is better than all of us think it is. Great is, article. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. So everyone, thanks for hanging out with us in chat, and uh, yeah.